on this week in Hockey East. TD Garden is here. The semis and finals are upon us. We break it all down and give you the NCAA tournament implications of a massive weekend in Boston. It's all coming up on this week in Hockey East. Hi, everyone, and welcome to semifinal and final week on this week in Hockey East. Tyler Murray, Eric Galanti with you. We have a couple of fantastic semifinal games to talk about some amazing crowd fan bases that should create just an amazing atmosphere both friday and saturday are expected to be sold out and it starts with number one boston college taking on umass and then maine and bu in the second semifinal. we're going to dive in and pick three things each that stand out on each of these mass matchups and see if we can diagnose what you might see what you should look for in a couple of really good games uh, we're really excited about the fact that our very own Tyler Murray will be on the call on Nesson for these two games on Friday and then the game on Saturday. So we're thrilled for Tyler getting the chance. Jim Connolly and I will be on the radio side on the Odyssey app for game number one when Massachusetts takes on Boston College. Uh, BC swept UMass in the regular season, but it was not for lack of intrigue in those games. Uh, Tyler, let's jump right in. What stands out to you as we take a look at this matchup? Yeah, I, I can't wait to see this game again. February 18th, one of the better games across Hockey East all season. And UMass, I think they played well enough to go into County Forum and win that game. They certainly played well enough to go on the road and beat Providence at Schneider Arena in the quarterfinals. For my money, they haven't played a better 60 minutes all season. And it started right from the opening minute with a new look junior line. These guys were together in the first month of the year. Ryan Lawton back, Lucas Mercury, and Taylor McCarr. But... They were back together for the first time since November 3rd, and they score 67 seconds in. Uh, they tried some different things at the left wing spot. Uh, Mercury and Lawton back have played together for all but about two or three games this season. Michael Cameron sometimes that left winger with them. Idar Sunyev most recently, but for the playoffs for the first time in a while, in a winner go home game, they ride Taylor McCarr as part of that junior class up there. And man, did it pay off. I mean, they really liked McCarr's game against Maine two Saturdays ago. And Greg Carville has always said, if Taylor McCarr is playing at his best, he's got the speed and physicality to fly around the ice and be that kind of player that stands out if you're maybe watching UMass for the first time. Uh, Carson Duggan was on the call with us that day. She didn't hear that quote from Greg Carville, but around the second period, she said, you know, Taylor McCarr is flying around the ice. I keep noticing him. So he, he's living up to that high ceiling. And uh, the way it sets up the rest of that line sheet for UMass, I think right now is the most well-rounded version of the deepest forward group Greg Carville has ever had for the Minutemen. So you get that top line we talked about, but then Sunyev, Connors, and Cameron second line, really good speed and skill for them. Kenny Connors scored the dagger to make it 3-0 in the quarterfinals. We talked two weeks ago about Musa, Lashmilis, and O'Hara. Uh, that's led to the best stretch of Cole O'Hara's career. Part of that third line is averaging about a point per game. And then the fourth line, this has come together recently as well. Three grad transfers, all six feet or bigger, with real physical games. Liam Gorman, Lucas Van Roboys, and Christian Sanda. They've taken on the identity. I don't want to say Bash Brothers necessarily, but they're out there to throw their weight around, bring that playoff intensity, and just not giving an inch without punishing other teams by throwing checks around. So we'll see if, if they can. They're not going to have the, uh, the last change as a low seed, but we'll see if they can match up that really dynamic fourth defensive line and checking line against the high-end skill guys for Boston College. And oh, by the way, Scott Morrow, who we all know is that six foot two blue line dynamo for UMass, he started playing down low on the power play. I had to rub my eyes watching this at Schneider Arena last weekend. Is that 23 down there? He looks like a classic power forward on the power play. So a little bit of ingenuity for the Minutemen. Didn't score a goal with Morrow on the power play, but led to a lot of really good chances. They hit about three posts, five on four in the quarterfinal round, and Morrow was a big part of that. So uh, a bit of a wrinkle heading in to TD Garden. Tyler, I'm going to see how good we are at this this late in the season because I'm going to change our rundown on the fly because one of my three things just follows exactly what you said, and that's can this UMass team outscore Boston College? And that sounds really simple, but here's what I mean by that. We've seen UMass win games with their defense with Michael Hrabel, They've been really good in those games. We have seen UMass score four goals against BC. To their credit, they did that at Conti Forum, losing that game six to four. But they haven't done it much, and BC hasn't scored less than three much. In fact, BC has scored less than three goals all of one time since November 17th. So if UMass can't get this game into a low-scoring game, can they 
have enough offense, find enough offense with some of those line changes to generate five on five. We know they can score on the power play. They've done it. But remember, when you play this Boston College team, you're going up against the number one penalty kill in the country. But are these line combinations finding enough? Let's dive into the numbers and see what we can figure out. We told you the Boston College side of it. They score three all the time. They've scored five goals, by the way, in eight of their last nine games. So for UMass, since January 13th, they've scored three goals seven times. They've exceeded three goals only twice. The overtime game against Lowell. And as we said, to their credit, at Conti Forum against Boston College on that Sunday afternoon. If you look at expected goals, they've only had more than three expected goals twice since the start of February. So the question becomes, can that offensive output rise enough if the Eagles are scoring at their average of what they've been the last couple of months? One reason I think it can, I love the way they've started games recently on the offensive side. They scored two goals in the first four minutes and 16 seconds against Providence in the quarterfinal. They scored 254 into the first period in the game against Maine. So it's not that UMass can't play from behind against Boston College, but I love the fact that they're scoring early because it is difficult to chase the game against a team that tends to score as much as Boston College scores. So can they generate enough? That's what I'm looking for, and I'm really excited to see it because I think, as you said, they found some line combinations that might make the answer to that question yes. And as you get further in these games, we're trying to figure out how important is getting a lead after two periods with not a huge sample size for Boston College. I'll explain this in a sec, but these are two of the best third period teams in terms of goal differential in the country. But BC is harder to analyze. Are they good in the third or are they just good? I mean, plus 20 in the first period, plus 30 in the second, and plus 23 in the third. But we don't have a ton to look at when it comes to third period comes back, comebacks for BC because they've only trailed after two periods twice all year, including their last loss. That was against BU in the Beanpot. And then way back in November in a crazy back-and-forth game against UConn that they wind up winning. Now, there are a few examples that don't fit into that category, and notably they were down 2-1 at Maine in that second game. Four minutes left when Ryan Leonard scores the game-tying goal, and then BC wins in the shootout. But the headliner here is how good UMass has been when trailing entering the third period. They've got five wins when down after two. That's the most in the league by a comfortable margin. But again, a, a decent part of that is, you know, BU and BC not trailing after two, not needing to come back. But when UMass is ahead, they're 9 and one entering the third period. Now, BC has actually dropped two games in those situations, which makes up for 40% of their losses this year, uh, one against Denver and another at Providence. But I guess the takeaway there is if UMass can stay at least within a goal, Heading into the third period, you know they have at least a legitimate shot. And that's all you can ask. I mean, a coin flip game against Providence, they get it done. You know you're going to have to play BC eventually if you want to hoist the Lamarillo Trophy this season. So if they can just keep it tight, you know they have a chance, especially after that crazy third period back on February 18th, where I think a lot of fans would agree the five-on-three power play is what swung the game for BC, not necessarily them outplaying UMass, just you know, taking advantage of those opportunities. So, uh, yeah, if it's a one-goal BC lead after two, uh, do not change the channel heading to the third. So let's talk a little bit more about the Boston College side of things. And I think the biggest takeaway from that UConn quarterfinal game is that no matter how much we talk about skill, no matter how much we talk about freshmen, experience still matters in the playoffs. And that came in the form of Jack Malone on Saturday, who I think was the best player on the ice by the eye test. And also, by the way, was the best player on the ice for Boston College by game score as well. Shout out to BU Hockey Stats for pulling that information for us. Uh, Malone was great. Two goals and an assist in that game. Remember, he was with Cornell, came in as a grad transfer. And that's one of those little X factors this year. When you have a team that has the record that Boston College has, that BU has, that any of these teams have, they're under the radar things that we don't talk about as much. And the fact is that Boston College nailed their grad transfers this year. Jacob Bankson has been huge and scored a goal, by the way, on Saturday. Jamie Armstrong, since coming back from injury, has been really impactful. Four goals here in a short span. And then Jack Malone, who came in as a grad transfer from Cornell, who, remember, was in the NCAA tournament a season ago for the Big Red. So he has been there before. And Greg Brown told us postgame that he was the guy when UConn was on their ferocious comeback, tying the game, that was going up and down the bench saying, we're okay, we're okay, we're still in this. He was that guy for Boston College. 
And remember, he was the one who eventually scored the game winning goal. So it's really important to have that experience on your roster. And there's really more than one way to talk about experience, right? Experience in terms of players, experience in terms of having been at the Garden before. And Boston College, since they lost to Boston University in that semifinal game of the Bean Pot, of course, has not dropped a game. And they feel like they've learned the lesson that they needed to learn out of that BU game. And that is the start. And if we want to talk about the start in playoff games, and I know it's not apples to apples, but you look at that start against BU, you look at the start, what they did against UConn. Now, they, it wasn't all the way through, but you look at the start against UConn, and certainly they learned the lesson there. So have they really taken that lesson to heart when they get back to the Garden? Can they rely on that experience? Because remember, that semifinal game against BU, it felt like if that game was five minutes longer, there might have been a different result. BC kind of outplayed BU the last two periods of that game, but BU got off to a great start as we talked about. So can BC pull on that experience from both sides of things? I think it's going to be really important. Yeah, I think when the uh, you know the opening day rosters, I guess, were announced, and of course you had all the, the first round pick headliners for BC. I think what stood out to us was just a renewed experience and physicality from those transfers. Jamie Armstrong's a fourth liner for BU. That's exactly the kind of player that BC needs to get that transfer. And of course, we know how good Cornell is at their structured defense. So yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Those two guys have really meant a whole lot to that team as they uh, try to uh, uh, complete what's been a long journey. It could be an incredible finish for them. And uh, a lot of it's going to come down to goaltending. Maybe not so much experience for these two freshman studs, but a lot of well-deserved praise. Coyotes second round pick Michael Robble for UMass, second team all hockey East goaltender. Canadians third round pick Jacob Fowler for BC, first team all hockey East. In the quarterfinals on Saturday, it was an expected goal total for UConn of 5.2. They had some great chances, obviously converted on three of them in about six minutes in the third, but Fowler made some huge stops to earn the win. Uh, the first goal in that comeback, Fowler snags, but I guess I had too much heat on it and it just uh, uh, dragged his uh, glove over the line. So that counted as a goal, as it should have. But uh, Michael Robbel on the other side, I keep going back to that game against BC February 18th. He had a great game there, which seems weird because it was a 6-4 loss, but he had 40 saves, which is still a career high. Three of those six goals came on the power play, including that five on three. And one goal was a Cutter Gauthier empty netter. But in those two games combined, you, you saw the superstar shine for BC. Gauthier had a three-goal weekend, and Ryan Leonard scored five times against his older brother's old team, and his hometown team, and Amherst native. Uh, but Fowler, he allowed those four goals to UMass, as you said. That's the tied for the most he surrendered all season. Two came from Idar Sunyev in about 29 seconds. So, I mean, this is really intriguing because according to the coaches and the league, and I think both of us, these are the two best goaltenders in the league. But in the last month, each team has seen the puck go in the back of the net against these two incredible goaltenders. So uh, I can't wait to watch this one. It's always fun to watch the Bruins, right, and seeing a hockey East goaltending matchup every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Swayman versus Ottinger, Swayman versus Hellebuck. But, I mean, we might just see Hrabble versus Fowler um, across uh, across the NHL sooner rather than later. I just can't wait to see how they're going to shine on the big stage at TD Garden. Last thing for this game, let's stay on the BC front. And I think, you know, we've talked so much about Gabe Perot. Will we see Gabe Perot? Will we not see Gabe Perot? Uh, Greg Brown has mentioned we've kind of gone from week to week to day to day. We're not sure. So let's just talk about in these five games since Gabe Perot has not been with BC, this might actually be a great, you know, litmus test as a person, whether you're a glass half full or glass half empty person, right? Have they been quite as crisp on offense? I don't think so. Has their power play been great? Quite as good. Uh, it has not. Just two for 18 in the five games since Perot has not been there. Uh, that's not necessarily all on him, but just, you know, lining up those five games. So that's one side of it. The other side of it, though, is they've won all of these games and they've scored more than five goals. There's four goals in all, but that one nothing win against New Hampshire. Uh, they haven't lost a game, as we said, since Beanpot. They've lost two games in 2024. So sometimes when you have really great teams, you start to grade on a little bit of a different curve without even realizing it. And BC has continued to win these games. But where is their offense? Where is their line combinations without Gabe Perot? I thought that UConn did a really nice job taking the Gauthier, Smith, and Leonard line out. And Greg Brown deserves a lot of credit because midway through that third period, he switched things up and he brought Gauthier with Gasso and Malone, who were his two best forwards in the game. And right after he made that switch, that's what led to the game-winning goal. Jim Connolly did a great job at describing it on our broadcast. You could see the breakout play that Brock Boston College ran. Gauthier kind of slid across. It took two UConn defenders with him 
just because of how much, you know, eyeballs he gets. And that allowed a wide open lane for Jack Malone and Gasso hit him on the pass. So it was a really smart choice there. Does Greg Brown stick with that combination? Or do we see Gabe Perot? And if we do, it's been a couple of weeks. What is he like? So I think those questions are going to be really important to see for Boston College. Again, they've still scored 21 goals in five games without him. So it's by no means uh, bad. They haven't been quite as crisp on the power play. uh, But now with a couple of wake-up calls and the fact that they've won those games, uh, it will be very interesting to see what things look like on Friday. And we know, of course, it's a four o'clock puck drop for game one. That's the only thing we know, though. I'm never even I'm not even going to say puck drop time for game two because of all the overtimes we've seen the last couple of years. And why not as evenly matched as these teams seem to be? But the nightcap will be BU against Maine two versus three old school rivalry. 1995 National Championship showdown. Jay Pandolfo has said when he was playing during those days in the in the later 90s, Maine was the big rival just because BC had a bit of a down era. But I think a lot of people wondering what it might look like to see BU and BC in the, the uh, Hockey East Tournament Championship. But this one, I mean, I, I'm almost just as intrigued at BU against Maine. Let's break this one down, Eric, with a lot of star power on those top lines for both teams, but especially Maine. Yeah, and how about Maine? It feels like they've kind of reawoken here as the season has gone on. Remember, Maine dropped five of six from February 10th to March 1st, but now they've won four in a row again. The last two games, they've scored more than four goals. They looked really good in a 5 nothing game against New Hampshire. And remember how good New Hampshire's defense has been all year long. Uh, But the biggest thing here is the Nadeau brothers. Um, If you look at where they've been, Bradley Nadeau, two goals, two assists against New Hampshire, He has three goals and three assists in his last three games. He had just three points in his prior six, right in line with that stretch of dropping a couple games that we talked about. Josh Nadeau, same exact line. Two goals, two assists on Saturday. Three goals, three assists in his last three games. Only had two points in his prior six games. Maine needs those two guys. They just do. 32% of Maine's goals this year come from the Nadeau brothers on their own. So... Have they found their groove once again? We talk so much about how amazing all of these freshmen are throughout Hockey East, and it's easy to forget their freshmen because it's not easy, and you do go through some ups and downs sometimes, but it feels like, Tyler, they've kind of figured it out again. And if they've figured it out again, watch out. Uh, They're also going to be watching out, of course, like the rest of us are for Macklin Celebrini, 17-year-old phenom, And the question is, like for every team, can you find a way to slow this kid down? My question is, what do you define as slowing down Macklin Celebrini? I think a team would sign up for just giving up one goal per game against him right now. Because his last five, he scored seven times and dished out five assists. He just became the first Terrier with a 30-goal season since Chris Drury in 96-97. He had 38 that year, which uh, matched the total from the previous season, scored by current BU coach Jay Pandolfo, who is looking to stay undefeated in the uh, Hockey East Tournament as a head coach. Of course, he's uh, 2-0 with two overtime wins last year. Celebrini's goal in the quarterfinals was was superstar stuff. Uh, Justin Ritzkobian, a star in his own right for Northeastern, he had just scored his second goal to make a 3-0 game, a 3-2 nail-biter. And even before the nervous energy got into the building, Celebrini scored 26 seconds later to put that game away late in the third. And we've talked about this not-so-new-look top line with Jack Harvey averaging a point per game in the 11 games since he joined Celebrini on that top line. And I think that reunion with former USHL teammates have gone even better than expected. And it was never a case of, oh, let's make Macklin happy and put him with his old buddy. No, it's the fact that Jack Harvey is a phenomenal player. He's got great vision, of course, to find number 71 all over the ice, but a really nice goal-scoring touch around the net. We saw that especially when he scored twice in 27 seconds against Merrimack back on uh, February 9th. Uh, In the regular season sweep against Maine at Aganis, uh, we had a Celebrini show, a power play goal in Game 1, and then three assists in Game 2, and that was well before he was playing with Jack Harvey. So the the closest example we can look to lately is what Maine did against UNH's top line in the quarterfinals. Ryan Conmey, Sila Claren, Liam Devlin. UNH had their best season in 10 years, primarily because of how well those three guys played together. They were held to just four shots on Saturday. And against them, uh, two goals went in against Jakob Helston. So uh, that's a real feather in the cap for Maine, the way they're able to really somehow find a way to outplay that incredible trio 
throughout that game in a, in a must-win scenario. They're going to need to find a way to do it against maybe an even higher level of top line against BU. Yeah, you know, you made the point earlier, do we have the two best goalies in Hockey East in game one? Uh, and you may very well be right. I think you are right. But uh, there's a guy starting in game two who might be the guy that we don't talk about enough in this league, and that is Matthew Curran. Um, I put ourselves in that category, too, for the record. Uh, he's not one of the big freshmen. He didn't come in with that much hype coming in from Brown. We'd love to talk about offense with BU, and it's deserved. But since the Beanpot loss, um, Karan has allowed 10 goals in seven games. That's it. That's all this BU defense has allowed. Uh, 30 saves in back-to-back games against Providence in mid-February. Uh, remember, he had 30-plus against Boston College in the Beanpot semifinal. He's been really good. And by the way, his 18 wins in Hockey East play this year are the second most, tied for the second most that any goalie has had in Hockey East play since 1985. The guy who has the most is Jacob Fowler this year. He had 19. So uh, it gets a little bit overshadowed. But Matthew caron has been really good for Boston University. Uh, and this defense as a whole, Cade Weber, 119 blocks. That is a new NCAA record for a season. He's already seven clear of the record, and BU doesn't expect their season to be over anytime soon. He's averaging nearly 3.7 blocks per game. Remember what the conversation was about this defense early in the season when they lost that game to New Hampshire, even a couple of the exhibition games, which I don't don't matter, the game against Notre Dame to start. This defense was not talked about all that positively at that point. Again, I give you 10 goals allowed in seven games. Uh, This BU defense is nothing to just write off. And it'll be interesting. We know early goals take crowds out of it, but can you take a main fan base out of the atmosphere for the nightcap between BU and Maine? I mean, first trip to the Garden for the Black Bears since 2012. That year, it was a semifinal matchup against BU. They beat them, but then lost to BC in the title game. The same thing actually happened in uh, 2010. If you're a Maine fan and you have a ticket to this sold-out weekend, you're not giving that thing up. You get to TD Garden, and you go in. Yes, you do. Can they create a little bit of that Alphon atmosphere for a Black Bear team that was so good at home this year? 13 wins, two losses, two ties. But 8-8 eight and eight on the road. Of course, BU and BC play twice at TD Garden every year for the Beanpot. BU just won this conference tournament last year. UMass's vaunted junior class, they were all freshmen when they won the tournament here two years ago, so they all have that valuable experience on this stage. But look a little closer at that 500 road record for Maine. I'm actually more impressed with the wins than I am worried about the losses. The first road game of the year was kind of their coming out party. They went to Quinnipiac and beat the number five team in overtime. Uh, and then, you know, last month they go to UMass, beat the Minutemen, one nothing in Amherst. Uh, Brandon Chabrier happened to have both goals uh, from a blue line spot uh, for Maine in those uh, two very impressive road wins. And yes, they lost both games at Aganis Arena playing BU in November, but it wasn't because they were intimidated. At 14 seconds into that first game, Thomas Friel scored, but Macklin Celebrini tied the game 100 seconds later, so they kind of lost that early momentum. But in both of those games against BU, they were down multiple goals, came back both nights to make it a one-goal game, and they wind up across the two-third periods. They outscore BU 4-3 to three in those final 20-minute segments. So. I mean, since we're talking about their track record against BU and UMass, it's also worth mentioning they took four of six from BC. Yes, it was at home during the regular season, but even though it's been a while, and even though their most experienced uh, staff member or player at the Garden is Ben Barr because he was there coaching uh, with UMass, it's uh, it's not, I don't think, going to be an overwhelming uh, place for them to step into, especially with a raucous Uh, fan base expected to be on hand for those Black Bears making the trip down. And we will see how their freshman goaltender does in that atmosphere. And, you know, this is one of those moves that, you know, if Maine goes on to do the things that Maine might go on to do and they make a documentary about this team and we watch it, uh, they're talking about the decision that Ben Barr made in goal because Victor Osman did not lose this job. Uh, Albin Boya won this job. And Ben Barr has gone with his freshman. He started seven games in a row now in 11 of his last 12. He shut out New Hampshire in the quarterfinals. Remember, he pitched that shutout a little bit earlier in the month of February against UMass. And now Maine, you know, to their credit, has done a pretty good job limiting shots in front of him. He hasn't had to steal a ton of games, but 
you know, he's been big. And the one really big shot volume game he had was another one against UMass on March 9th. He made 34 saves. Maine won that game 4-3, to three, solidifying their place as the number three seed in this tournament. Um, he made, you know, it. it's really impressive what he's done as a freshman not having the job early in the season and not just winning the job but winning the confidence of his team and his players in front of him right because that's you know almost as important um the atmosphere as we said it's a little bit different it's his first time in there um how will he handle that stage gonna be fascinating to find out but um you know, it's it's one of those coaching things. Sometimes, you know, we love to nerd out about coaching decisions and subtly changing the lines and things like that. And uh, it really interesting choice, right, to, to, to make this call. Again, where Osman, it's not really about him losing his job. Uh, it's just Boya has played so well uh, and to his credit, stuck with him during that streak where they dropped a couple of games that we talked about. And he's he's made Ben Barr look like a smart man here the last couple of games to get them back to this point. And we both know Ben Barr is a smart man. What a job he's done to to get them into this position. Now, you, you talked about Gabe Perot for Boston College. If you get him back, not only does that give you a high-end forward, one of the very best in the country, but it kind of lets other pieces fall into place. Mm -hmm. I think something similar happened for Boston University with Dylan Peterson coming back. He missed four games due to injury until the quarterfinals where he had an assist against Northeastern. So the Terriers are healthy. They're peaking at the right time. Uh, you highlighted the last seven games. I'll go with six wins in a row, outscoring opponents 31-8. to eight. They haven't had a one-goal game during this stretch. I remember last year at the Garden, they were down in the third period to both Providence in the semis and Merrimack in the championship. So they had to get that late-game tying goal. Peterson had the one against Providence, and then each Hudson brother in both rounds had the overtime winner because that's just what the, the Hudsons do. So this isn't the kind of weekend where you can you know score early and cruise. So similar to handling UConn's comeback for BC, I think handling a Northeastern late charge was probably valuable for uh, Boston University. Uh, mm -hmm. But with Peterson back, this line chart feels more loaded than ever. Uh, Cade Weber, you know, the Hockey East Defender of the Week, his quote to uh, the Boston Hockey Blog was, that fourth line with Peterson, Stevens, and Tuck, I'd put against any line in the country. They're just hard to play against. They're relentless. So we'll see if that's the line Jay Pandolfo wants to match up against the Nadeau brothers, who are coming off uh, another uh, Hockey East co-player of the week tandem. And, uh, yeah, they are the high seed, so they'll get the, the last change, the Terriers, as the two. Um, but, yes, an assist in the quarterfinals for Peterson. And he's six foot four. We talk a lot about his goal scoring ability, but uh, his size brings a physicality and a skill that's kind of tough to replicate when you match him up with Luke Tuck and Sam Stevens. And, and Luke Tuck uh, was honored this week as well for his great quarterfinal effort. Remember the start of the year, fourth line for BU, all about size. Six five, Shane Lachance, six three, Doug Grimes, and Stevens, who's still there at six foot. And that led to some good things early in the year. But now you really do have the best of both worlds because you can play Shane Lachance on that top line and get that big body net front position like he does on the power play when he's with Celebrini and oftentimes with Lane Hudson out there. Now, that's just kind of part of their regular lineup, Celebrini and Lachance and Hudson with uh, some other great skill guys mixed in as well. But yes, Peterson, he's been clutch. He had the 2022 Beanpot game-winning goal. It was a 0-0 game against Northeastern, under three minutes left. And then, as we said, two and a half minutes left against uh, Providence. He gets that game tying goal to force overtime. So uh, he knows what it takes to make a difference late at TD Garden. They're very happy to have him back. All right, wrapping things up here, Eric. Jam-packed episode today, but only time for one short shift. It's presented by The Shift Group, helping elite athletes and veterans become elite sales professionals. Of course, every team we've talked about wants to win twice, get the auto bid, get the trophy, but there is a possibility that uh, UMass can still find their way in, right? Yeah, and it's actually a pretty good one. And, you know, we'll try to explain this as quickly as possible. We've gone a little long today, but, you know, there, so there's not as much on the line in terms of the NCAA tournament as you might think, but for UMass, it's very, very important. Uh, let's start with the easy stuff. BU is locked, BC, excuse me, is locked in as the number one overall seed in the tournament. BU is locked in as the number two overall seed in the tournament. That cannot change. By the way, first time since 2004, hockeyists will have two one seeds in the NCAA tournament. So uh, that, you know, we kind of sometimes lose the big picture because we're so locked in, but that's pretty impressive. Uh, those two teams. Now, where they'll be, uh, we're going to get to that conversation in a second. Maine has a pretty equal chance, depending on where you look, of finishing five, six, or seven. So they're pretty safely a two seed. Uh, they haven't completely been eliminated from being a one. There's, you know, less than a 10% chance, but there's a slight chance if they were to win hockey's 
and the right things were to happen, they could jump up, but in all likelihood, they'll be a two seed. They'll be with Quinnipiac as the two East Coast two seeds. So we'll see how that affects their seeding. But here's the case with UMass. Let's start with the simplest one first. If they beat Boston College, they are in. Locked, done, no questions asked. If they don't, they still have a pretty good chance. The good news is that when UMass went to sleep on Saturday, their chances of a loss to BC and still getting in were around 65 to 75%. Everything that needed to go right for them on Sunday went right. And their chances now are, depending on where you look, playoffstatus.com gives them about an 81% chance with a loss to BC of still making it in the field. Um, College Hockey News, USCHO, they're all about the same right in that area. Uh, you're looking at bid stealers when it comes to UMass. They're they're right around 12 right now in the pairwise. The cut line is 14. So remember, we've told you all year, it's so volatile between those teams on the bubble. There's such a small margin. UMass, if they were to lose to BC, is not going to drop very much. Losing to number one in a, in a neutral site, that's not a dropping scenario. But because everyone's so close, that's why, you know, they might ever so subtly, not because of anything they do. But if that cut line moves up, if Quinnipiac does not win the ECAC, and there are three chances for them not to, potentially. If the NCHC winner is St. Cloud, who is the one who's outside the cut line right now, um, then all of a sudden, if both of those scenarios happen, which again, 81%, so not likely, but if both of those scenarios happen, all of a sudden the cut line is all the way up at 12, and things get really precarious in that spot. So those, are, if you're a UMass fan and you do not beat Boston College, you are rooting for Quinnipiac, and you were rooting against St. Cloud in the other two tournaments that we have to talk about. Um, the thing that kind of does get decided is the seeding, right? If UMass loses to BC but still gets in, it'll be a four seed. If UMass beats BC, there's an opportunity for them to move up to a three, which may be a factor because, remember, we've talked all year about how UMass is the host in Springfield. If they get in the tournament, they will be in Springfield. And I want to just put this warning out there right now for college hockey fans, um, the NCAA tournament committee is very likely to have to break their protocols this year. Uh, let's just throw out why. UMass is the host of the Springfield Regional. Omaha is the host of the Sioux Falls Regional. If those two teams get in, which they are in right now, they have to go to those two sites. There also is the potential for teams like Colorado College, like even potentially St. Cloud, like Western Michigan, who are all around the four seed mark along with UMass. The one seeds, if the season ended before any of these games, would have two NCHC one seeds, North Dakota and Denver. So based on the rules of the tournament, if you can't play conference affiliations, you could have three one seeds of the four that cannot play the four seed that they are supposed to be matched up with without any changes. So, and the committee, by the way, cannot move two of those four, four seats. We're getting really in the weeds, but the point is um, if you see the committee not protect the number one overall seed, for example, if you see the committee end up playing teams against their own conference in the first round, even if there's less than five from one conference, um, they're going to have to potentially if this all sorts out the way it looks like it very well may, uh, they're going to have to potentially do something that they've never really had to do before. So don't be surprised by that when it potentially happens. Um, that's all in the future, though. This weekend should be an absolute blast at TD Garden. Uh, we cannot wait for it. Again, Tyler will be there on TV. Jim Connolly and I will be there on the Odyssey app and on WEEI for the non-Boston College games. Uh, we can't wait to bring it to you. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this was informative. Can't wait to see you for a, a, what we expect to be a sellout crowd at TD Garden this week in Hockey East.